Hello and welcome, my dear brethren, to another reading of Babylon Mystery Religion from Jörg from YouTube channel Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. We have arrived at chapter 9 called Religious Fraud, and this is where I pick up the reading of Babylon Mystery Religion, the book from Ralph Woodrow. I will start right here, because I've just been very stupid and reading chapter 10 in without reading chapter 9. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to skip that, I just saw over it. So, here it comes now, but the videos will be uploaded in the right order. The author says that the sale of relics, it's caused called religious fraud, as I already said, I think, the sale of relics, church offices and indulgences, became big, big, big business within the Church of the Middle Ages. Pope Boniface VIII declared a jubilee year, a jubilee for the year 1300, and offered liberal indulgences to those who would make a pilgrimage to St. Peter's. An estimated two million people came within that year and deposited such treasure before the supposed tomb of St. Peter's, that two priests with rakes in their hands were kept busy day and night raking up the money. It's not very much different from today. All the money goes to the Vatican. Much of this, the author continues, was used by the Pope to enrich his own relatives. <laughs> the Gaetani, who bought numerous castles and splendid estates in Latium. This was strongly resented by the people of Rome. Really? But still they gave, eh? From the days of Constantine, the Roman Church had increased in wealth at a rapid pace. In the Middle Ages, the Church owned entire cities and large portions of land. Those who lived in Catholic countries were required to pay taxes to the Church. This was not giving from the heart, but fees paid Quote unquote, of necessity, a principle which was opposed by the Apostle Paul, as we can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Quote, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Unquote. When you really want to learn <clears throat> what the riches of the Vatican are, and how they gathered it all together, I can give you two advices to listen to or to read. The first is a book written by a Knight of Malta called Avro Manhattan, and the book is called The Vatican Billions. Billions! I think we should either say trillions. And the second is listen to my dear brother in Christ Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. In a lot of his readings, also I think in the last that he just finished on in uh, First Amendment Radio and Inquisition Update, Rome and Civil Liberty by James Aitken Wiley, he also goes a little bit into the riches. And when you have the chance to go into the archives of First Amendment Radio, you will find the readings uh, when you dig deep, where Tom Fress read uh, A Woman Writes the Beast, the book by Dave Hunt. And there also you can see how the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church gathered enormous, even not to imagine how much riches they gathered through the centuries. And otherwise, just listen to me here a little bit because of the religious fraud. The author continues, in those days... Few people know how to write, so priests were often involved in drafting wills. And Tom lays that out very nice in his readings that he does. In 1170, Pope Alexander III decreed that no one could make a valid will except in the presence of a priest. You know, the sacrament of the last unction, the last oiling, the Roman Catholic priests give them, sending out every, everyone out of the room where the dying person is laying and then getting the will. Because if now, that's the way that Tom explains it much better than I can, 
Now, to free you from your sins and to buy a shorter time in purgatory, which is of course not biblical, give me all your money! Give me, give me, give me, give me! This is what the Roman Catholic Church is really good with. Give me, give me, give me. Give me all your money. No, this is not from the movie with Tom Cruise, the movie Jerry Maguire, because that is there it is called, show me the money. Give me the money, says the Pope. The Pope doesn't want you to show him the money, he wants you to give it. <laughs> so he decreed that no one could make a valid will except in the presence of a priest, and by that donating all his possessions to the Roman Catholic Church. Any secular notary who drew up a will, except under these circumstances, was to be excommunicated. So I don't think that the notaries really wanted to be excommunicated because they believe what the Roman Catholic Church taught and to be excommunicated means that you can never see heaven. The Pope couldn't do me a bigger favor than to excommunicate him, me from the Church of Rome. I have to say, <laughs> because in that church there's no salvation found. Anyway, often the priest was the last person to be with a dying man, for he would give the last rites, the extreme unction. Okay, I already told you a little bit about that, that's because I prepared chapter 10 or chapter 9, I forgot about my notes, but I have a little note here that says, this is one of the five false sacraments of the Church that are not written in the Bible. Without these sacraments, so the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, there is no salvation. So the people on the dying bed gave all, or most of it, of their possessions to the Church to experience less time in purgatory. Can you imagine how wealthy the Church got by this betrayal? Can you now see why the Roman Catholic Church now, where Protestantism is dead, gets it all back from all of us? Because the Protestant churches do not identify the Antichrist with the Popery anymore. We have erred in the Roman Catholic point of view and are to restore all her wealth taken since the Reformation. Now, <laughs> as I already said, you want to learn more of this? Go to Tom Fress's reading of so Rome and Civil Liberty on First Amendment Radio and you get a history lesson like never before. Add to this his former reading of the Global Vatican that you can find also in the archives of the YouTube channel of First Amendment Radio and you will clearly see who the enemy of mankind today and historically is. And I will put the link of the playlist of First Amendment Radio in there, and there you can find the playlist of Global Vatican and the playlist of Rome and Civil Liberty, that uh, book that Tom just finished about a week ago, reading there in 2016 now. And you can really get a better history lesson than I can do here, because Tom is so much more eloquent than me. But, okay, we work together, so... <coughs> reading on. With such arrangements we can be sure the Roman Church was well remembered. <laughs> what would you feel like when you've just lost a family member and um, the priest comes out of there walking away with all the money and then you're thinking, oh, now we have a nice home and we have this and we have that because he possesses this and he possesses that and we're going to inherit that? <laughs> the Roman Catholic priest is just thinking, it's mine, it's mine, and I bring it to the Pope. The selling of indulgences, the author continues, provided another source of income, so that there will be no misunderstanding as to just what an indulgence is in Catholic belief. We will go right to the Catholic Encyclopedia. As always, the Roman Catholic Church says it best in their own words. Here it is explained that sins committed after baptism, which for a Catholic is usually an infancy, which is of course not biblical, can be forgiven through the sacrament of penance. Quote, but there still remains the temporal punishment required by divine justice, and this requirement must be fulfilled either in the present life or in the world to come, in purgatory.
and indulgence offers the penitent sinner the means of discharging this debt during this life on earth. Unquote. This point should be carefully noted. So when you have a pen and paper, write it down. To go a step further, we should consider the basis according to the Catholic belief. Um, what's that here? There's a note here. Ah, um, according to the Catholic belief on which indulgences are granted. The Catholic Encyclopedia, once again, says the basis or source for indulgences is the treasury. Now, and who are the guardians of the Vatican treasure? Who has followed my reading, chapter 17, I think it was? timely grand tour of rulers of evil. The Rothschilds are the guardians of the papal treasure. The following is a quote from the Jewish Encyclopedia, Articles Rothschild. Quote, it is a somewhat curious sequel to the attempt to set up a Catholic competitor to the Rothschilds, that at the present time the latter are the guardians of the papal treasure. Unquote. So for all you betrayed souls out there who run and chase after a so-called quote-unquote Jewish conspiracy on the money fraud, let me tell you that the Rothschilds are papal knights of the order of St. John and of the Order of Malta. And those Catholic orders are the ones who run the financial system in the world, whose centre, by the way, is seated in the city of London, in the Square Mile, the Crown Templar little Square Mile in London. There is the financial head center of the financial head of this world and nowhere else. It's the Rothschilds who are the guardians of the Vatican treasure, of the papal treasure. So when you are a guardian, are you the owner <clears throat> or are you the one that just has to make sure more and more money gets into that and that you have to make sure that when you spend it, you spend it the way that the one who ordered you to be the guardian wants it to be spent. Well, that's the reason why the Rothschilds are war bankers and they use our gullibility and our ignorance to go to wars to fight for the Pope because there was never a war fought for quote-unquote, patriot reasons, if anyone could ever be a patriot in this kingdom anyway. My allegiance it was Christ, is with Christ, and Christ his kingdom, and I am patriotic for that, not for Germany that I was born in, not for Belgium that I live in, not for America, which I even love. But my allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom. How about yours? Anyway, I don't want to go too far away from the subject here. We can do a discussion about that if you like via the comments or you can ask me to do another video on that subject alone. But I will continue reading now on page 62 in the PDF. So the Catholic Encyclopedia says the basis of, or source for indulgences is the treasury. What the treasury of the papacy is, I've just explained to you. Now, this includes the infinite redemptive work of Christ, who is the propitiation for sins, as we can read in 1 John chapter 2 and the first five verses. Quote, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments, all ten of them. Who of you guys thinks that Christ did away with the law? The law that the Lord God wrote with his own finger on two stone tablets twice on Mount Sinai for Moses? That law is not abolished. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He, hath, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Unquote. So, this includes the infinite redemptive work of Christ, who is the propitiation for sins. Besides, notice the word, quote, There are the satisfactory works of the Blessed Virgin Mary, undiminished by any penalty due to sin, and the virtues, penances, and sufferings of the saints vastly exceeding any temporal punishment which these servants of God might have incurred, unquote. Because of the works these have performed, there is an extra supply or treasury of uh, merits, which make it possible for indulgences to be shared with others of the church who have not seen, who have not been as saintly. <laughs> Such was the doctrine dogmatically set forth in the bull Unigenitus, and I will provide a link in the description box of the video to this um, uh, Unigenitus bull where it is exclaimed what it's all about. You can read that and study that for yourself. This bull came forth from Pope Clement VI in 1334. Quote, According to Catholic doctrine, therefore, the source of indulgences is constituted by the merits of Christ and the saints. Unquote. Well, I'm quite sure that he does not speak of the same Jesus Christ that I speak of here. But, the author continues, if Christ is, quote-unquote, the propitiation for our sins, and his blood, quote-unquote, cleanses us from all sins, as we can read in First John uh, chapter 1, verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And we can also read in First John chapter 2, verse 2, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, as I already read a little bit earlier here. In what way can the merits of Mary and other saints possibly add to this? What Mary or other saints, saints did can add nothing to the completed work of Christ at Calvary. Nothing can be added because Christ said, It is finished. To us, such a rigmarole provides no support for the indulgence doctrine, but identifies it rather as a man-made fabrication. The whole Roman Catholic Church is a man-made fabrication, has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, and slanders the name of Christianity all over the world. Without a proper scriptural foundation, it is no wonder the idea of indulgences led to many abuses because granting indulgences was commonly linked with money. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia makes such statements as, quote, The practice was fraught with grave danger, and soon became a fruitful source of evil, a means of raising money. Indulgences were employed by mercenary ecclesiastics as a means of pecuniary gain. Abuses were widespread. End quote. 
One of the abuses was that some who hold indulgences to sinners were great sinners themselves. About 1450 AD, Thomas Gascoigne, Chancellor of Oxford University, complained that the indulgent sellers would wander after the land and issue a letter of pardon, sometimes for the payment of two pence, sometimes for a glass of beer, for the hire of a harlot, or for carnal love. At the time of Martin Luther, because of construction work on St. Peter's, a special drive was made by the Pope to raise money through the granting of indulgences. John Tetzel, known to be a man of poor conduct, but one who had ability as a quack fundraiser, was appointed to sell indulgences in Germany. The following is given as an eyewitness description of Tetzel's entry into a German town. Listen closely. Quote, when the indulgence seller approached the town, the bull, the Pope's official document, was carried before him on a cloth of velvet and gold, and all the priests and monks, the town council, the schoolmasters, and their scholars, and all the men and women went out to meet him with banners and candles and songs, forming a great procession. Then, with bells ringing and organs playing, they accompanied him to the principal church. A cross was set up in the midst of the church and the Pope's banner displayed. In short, one might think they were receiving God himself. In front of the cross was placed a large iron chest to receive the money, and then the people were induced in various ways to buy indulgences. Now it gets really funny. <clears throat> it is said that Tetzel carried with him a picture of the devil tormenting souls in purgatory <laughs> and frequently repeated the statement that appeared on the money box. Quote, and I will read this in German because it is in German because Tetzel did that in Germany. Quote, Sobald der Pfennig im Kasten klingelt, die Seele aus dem Feuer springt. Sobald der Pfennig im Kasten klingt, die Seele aus dem Feuer springt. Kann man auch sagen. Which freely translated means, for your English understanding people, as soon as the money in the casket rings, the troubled soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and you know why the people believe that? Because they did not have the word of God, they did not have the Bible, they couldn't check on it, they believed it. But you today have the Bible and you can prove Roman Catholicism wrong in all accounts. The rich gave large donations, while poverty-stricken peasants sacrificed what they could in order to help their loved ones in purgatory or to obtain pardon for their own sins. In medieval universities, the author continues also, those who wished to advocate certain opinions would publicly post, post theses, statements of their ideas, and invite discussion on these points. Following these custom, uh, this custom, Martin Luther nailed his famous 95 Thesis to the church door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. His 27th point was against the idea that as soon as money went into the collection box that souls would escape from purgatory. You can read the 95 Thesis if you want for yourself online. They are everywhere to be found on the internet. It was not at the castle church, however, that Tetzel held his meetings. Indulgence preachings was not allowed in Wittenberg, but many people had gone from there to hear Tetzel at Jutaborg, a nearby town. Luther began to speak out against the selling of indulgences and eventually against indulgences as such. He was denounced by Pope Leo X for saying, quote, Indulgences are pious frauds. Indulgences do not avail those who gain them for the remission of the penalty due to actual sin in the sight of God's justice. Unquote. Now, the Reformation did a good job of exposing the idea 
that the buying of indulgences could free souls from purgatory. And today that concept would not be promoted in the way it was at one time. Nevertheless, even today, there is still a linkage between giving money and prayers for the dead. Now, I have to read you a little bit that I got from a letter of His Holiness, Pope Francis, according to which an indulgence is granted to the faithful on the occasion of the extraordinary jubilee of mercy. Don't forget, 2016, we are in this year of jubilee. I do not think that I have time enough to read the whole letter or when I read it to comment on everything. So be aware of the Jesuitical casuistry and sophistry that is in that what I'm reading right now. The letter of his quote-unquote holiness, Pope Francis. To my venerable brother, Archbishop Rino Fisichella, President of the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization, with the approach of the extraordinary jubilee of mercy, I would like to focus on several points which I believe require attention to enable the celebration of the Holy Year to be for all believers a true moment of encounter with the mercy of God. It is indeed my wish that the Jubilee be a living experience of the closeness of the Father, whose tenderness is almost tangible, so that the faith of every believer may be strengthened and thus testimony to it be ever more effective. My thought first of all goes to all the faithful who, whether in individual dioceses or as pilgrims to Rome, will experience the grace of the Jubilee. I wish that the Jubilee indulgence may reach each one as a genuine experience of God's mercy, which comes to meet each person in the face of the Father who welcomes and forgives, forgetting completely the sin committed. The ex to experience and obtain the indulgence, the faithful are called to make a brief pilgrimage to the Holy Door, open in every cathedral or in the churches designated by the diocesan bishop and in the four papal basilicas in Rome, as a sign of the deep desire for true conversion. Likewise, I dispose that the indulgence may be obtained in the shrines in which the door of mercy is open, and in the churches which traditionally are identified as jubilee churches. It is important that this, <coughs> that this moment be linked first and foremost to the sacrament of reconciliation and to the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, <coughs> putting Christ in a wafer of bread, yeah, with a reflection on mercy. It will be necessary to accompany these celebrations with a profession of faith and with prayer for me. <laughs> for me, the Pope, and for the intentions that I bear in my heart, for the good of the Church and of the entire world. Additionally, I am thinking of those for whom, for various reasons, it will be impossible to enter the Holy Door, particularly the sick and people who are elderly and alone, often confined to the home. For them it will be of great help to live their sickness and suffering as an experience of closeness to the Lord, who in the mystery of his passion, death and resurrection, indicates the royal road which gives meaning to pain and loneliness. Living with faith and joyful hope this moment of trial, receiving communion or attending holy mass and community prayer, even through the various means of communication, will be for them the means of obtaining the Jubilee indulgence. My thoughts also turn to those incarcerated whose freedom is limited. The Jubilee year has always constituted an opportunity for great amnesty, which is intended to include the many people who, despite deserve deserving punishment, have become conscious of the injustice they worked and sincerely wish to re-enter society and make their honest contribution to it. May they all be touched in a tangible way by the mercy of the Father who wants to be close to those who have the greatest need of his forgiveness. 
They may obtain the indulgence in the chapels of the prison. May the gesture of directing their thought and prayer to the Father each time they cross the threshold of their cell signify for them their passage through the holy door, because the mercy of God is able to transform hearts and is also able to transform bars into an experience of freedom. <laughs> what is he telling the people in prison? <laughs> I have asked the Church in this jubilee year to rediscover the richness encompassed by the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. The experience of mercy indeed becomes visible with the witness of concrete signs as Jesus himself taught us. Each time that one of the faithful personally performs one or more of these actions, he or she shall surely obtain the jubilee indulgence. Hence, the commitment to live by mercy so as to obtain the grace of complete and exhaustive forgiveness by the power of the love of the Father who excludes no one. The jubilee indulgence is thus full. The fruit of the very event is to be celebrated and experienced with faith, hope and charity. Furthermore, the jubilee indulgence can also be obtained for the deceased. So, we are paying indulgences for the dead. What has changed in Rome? Huh? Nothing, huh? But Francis continues. <clears throat> we are bound to them by the witness of faith and charity that they have left us. Thus, as we remember them in the Eucharistic celebration, thus we can... In the great mystery of the communion of saints, pray for them that the merciful face of the Father free them from of every remnant of fault and strongly embrace them in the unending beatitude. Still continues. One of the serious problems, <coughs> excuse me, one of the serious problems of our time is clearly the changed relationship with respect to life. A widespread and intensive mentality has led to the loss of the proper personal and social sensitivity to welcome new life. The tragedy of abortion, who is the biggest abortioner in the world, is experienced by some with a superficial awareness, as if not realizing the extreme harm that such an act entails. Many others, on the other hand, although experiencing this moment as a defeat, believe that they have no other option. I, the Pope, think in particular of all the women who have resorted to abortion. I am well aware of the pressure that has led them to this decision. I know that it is an existential and moral ordeal. I have met so many women who bear in their heart the scar of this agonizing and painful decision. What has happened is profoundly unjust, yet only understanding the truth of it can enable one not to lose hope. The forgiveness of God cannot be denied to one who has repented, especially when that person approaches the sacrament of confession, with a sincere heart in order to obtain reconciliation with the Father. So, therefore, I have to approach the sacrament of confession to a priest, not to my Lord Jesus Christ, who can mediate for me to the Father for my sins and forgive my sins. No, the sacrament of confession with the Roman Catholic priest. Still, Pope Francis hasn't said enough. He is still continuing. For this reason, too, I, the Pope, have decided, notwithstanding anything to the contrary, to concede to all priests for the Jubilee year the discretion to absolve of the sin of abortion those who have procured it and who, with contrite heart, seek forgiveness for it. May priests fulfill this great task by expressing words of genuine welcome, combined with a reflection that explains the gravity of the sin committed, besides indicating a path of authentic conversion by which to a 
uh, by which to obtain the true and generous forgiveness of the Father who renews all with his presence. A final consideration, so he comes to an end, a final consideration concerns those faithful for or who for various reasons choose to attend churches officiated by priests of the fraternity of St. Pius X. This jubilee year of mercy excludes no one. From various quarters several brother bishops have told me of their good faith and sacramental practice. <laughs> sacramental practice, yeah. Unbiblical traditions. Combined, however, with an uneasy situation from the pastoral standpoint. I trust that in the near future solutions may be found to recover full communion with the priests and superiors of the fraternity. In the meantime, motivated by the need to respond to the good of these faithful, through my own disposition, through my own disposition, I establish that those who during the holy year of mercy approach these priests of the fraternity of St. Pius X to celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation shall validly and licitly receive the absolution of their sins. Trusting in the intercession of the Mother of Mercy, I, the Pope, entrust the preparations for this extraordinary jubilee year to her protection. Pope Francis from the Vatican, 1st of September 2015 I hope you understood all the lies that I was just reading here. And I will put the link in the description box of the video and of course this comes from w2vatican.va the Vatican's own website. You can read their lies online. <sighs> Indulgences. Jubilee year. Between the 30th of November 2015 and the 8th of December 2016. What he doesn't tell you is that this jubilee is the last ultimatum given to Protestants whether come back under the wings of the so-called Mother Church or bearing the consequences which will be the same as they've always been. Persecution, inquisition, torture, exterminating true Bible-believing Christians. Protestants of the papal system in Rome. Okay, I continue on the bottom of page 64 in the book now. Since priests must admit they have no way to know when souls actually pass out of purgatory into heaven, there is never really a settled peace in the matter. There is always the possibility that more money should be given on behalf of loved ones who have died. To play upon the love and tender memories of bereaved people, to take money for masses and long prayers, bring to mind those Jewish priests at the time of Jesus who would, quote, devour widows, houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. As we can read in Matthew 23, verse 14. Quote, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Unquote. Our Lord speaking. High Mass can be very expensive depending on the flowers, the candles, the number of priests taking part. It is sung in a loud tone of voice. The low mass, on the other hand, is much less expensive. Only six candles are used and it is repeated in a low voice. The Irish have a saying, High money, high mass. Low money, low mass. No money, no mass. <laughs> no money, 
you are in purgatory forever because you can't buy your way into heaven. Well, you can't buy your way into heaven when you're poor for the Roman Catholic Church. You cannot buy your way into heaven when you're poor in the Church of Jesus Christ either. You cannot buy your way into heaven, but you can get into heaven by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, repent of your sins and believe in Him and keep His commandments. That you can do. Everything else is baloney. Those who die without anyone to pay for masses in their behalf are called, quote, the forgotten souls in purgatory. However, these are remembered in special prayers on November 2nd, All Souls Day. If a Catholic fears he might become one of the forgotten souls, he may join the Purgatorian Society, which was established in 1856. I will include a link also on Wikipedia that you can read about the Purgatorial Society. So <laughs> you can really get all your information to really make it into, heaven, into the heaven of the Roman Catholic Church. Yahoo! <sighs> a contribution each year to the society will assure him that upon his death prayers will be set for his soul. During World War II, the Archbishop of Winnipeg, in a letter dated March 1st, 1944, urged Roman Catholic mothers to guarantee the salvation of their sons from purgatory by the payment to him of $40 for prayers and masses in their behalf. Oh, this is so sick. If it wasn't so funny, it was so sick. Ah. I will say it here quite clearly. Whether he be papal, protestant, pentecostal, no pope, priest, preacher, can guarantee the salvation of anyone, living or dead, on the basis of money given for his prayers. Jesus said it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, as we can read in Matthew 19, verses 23 and 24. But the payment of money could help a person escape from purgatory and go to heaven. Just the reverse would be true. Instead of it being hard for a rich man to enter heaven, riches would be a help. The Bible says, quote, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, as we can read in Psalms 49, verses 6 and 7. And the original quote from the King James Bible is, quote, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. If money cannot redeem a brother who is alive, who could redeem it if he's dead? There can be no mistake as to where Peter stood on the matter. He plainly said, we are, quote, not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. As we can read in First Peter, First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. I will give you the quote right here. 1 Peter, chapter 1, 18 and following. Quote, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in the last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Unquote. When the former Samaria sorcerer, and to make sure that you all understand this, the Samarian sorcerer, who is referred to here by Ralph Woodrow in this book, is Simon Magus. This is the Peter the Roman Catholic Church is built on. And this is something, and also Cain, the firstborn of Eve, 
you will understand that when we go into chapter 10, which I accidentally read before this one in. <laughs> you will understand that. But here he speaks about when the Sumerian sorcerer, meaning Simon Magus, who is, by the way, mentioned in Acts chapter 8, we go to that directly, offered Peter money to obtain a gift of God. Peter said, quote, To hell with you and your money! How dare you think you could buy the gift of God? Or, as Acts 8, verse 20 reads, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Unquote. These words are from the translation by J. B. Phillips. So the ones that I read before, to hell with you, you know. To which he adds a footnote. These are exactly that uh, what the Greek means. It is a pity that their real meaning is obscured by modern slang. Yeah. So turn to the King James Bible of 1611. There is no modern slang to be found in there. Roman Catholic ideas. <coughs> excuse me. Roman Catholic ideas about purgatory and prayers to help those in purgatory were not the teachings of Christ and of the Apostles. Such were not taught within the Catholic Church to any great degree until around 600 AD, when Pope Gregory the Great made claims about a third state, a place for the purification of souls before their entrance into heaven. It did not become an actual dogma until the Council of Florence in 15, uh, 1459. During the 12th century, a legend was spread which claimed that St. Patrick had found the actual entrance to purgatory. In order to convince some doubters, he had a very deep pit dug in Ireland, into which several monks descended. <clears throat> Upon their return, said the tale, they described purgatory and hell with discouraging vividness. In 1153, the Irish knight Owen claimed he had also gone down through the pit into the underworld. Tourists came from far and near to visit, visit the spot. Then financial abuses developed and in 1497 Pope Alexander VI ordered it closed as a fraud. Three years later, however, Pope Benedict XIV preached and published at Rome a sermon in favor for Patrick's purgatory. Beliefs about a purgatory have been around a long time. Plato, who lived between uh, 427 and 347 before Christ, spoke of the Orphic teachers of his day, quote, who flocked to the rich men's doors and tried to persuade them that they have a power at their command which they procure from heaven and which enables them by sacrifices and incantations to make demands for any crime committed by the individual himself or his ancestors, their mysteries deliver us from the torments of the other world, while the neglect of them is punished by an awful doom. Unquote. There have been times when so many Chinese Buddhists came to buy prayers for the deliverance of their loved ones from purgatory that special shops were set up for this purpose. There is an elaborate description of purgatorial suffering in the sacred writings of Buddhism. In the religion of Zoroaster, souls are taken through twelve stages before they are sufficiently purified to enter heaven. The Stoics conceived of a middle place of enlightenment, which they called empurosis, that is, quote, a place of fire. The concept of giving money on behalf of the dead is very ancient, a point which may be seen within the Bible itself. Apparently, the Israelites were exposed to this belief, for they were warned not to give money for the dead, as we can read in Deuteronomy 26, verse 14. Quote, I have not eaten thereof in my mourning, neither have I taken away aught thereof for any unclean use, nor given aught thereof for the dead. But I have hearkened to the voice of the Lord my God, and have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. Unquote. After presenting detailed evidence for his conclusion, 
Hislop, Alexander Hislop, in his book Two, uh, the Two Babylons, says, quote, In every system, therefore, except that of the Bible, the doctrine of purgatory after death and prayers for the dead has always been found to occupy a place. Unquote. It is very possible that concepts about purgatory and certain ideas linked with Molech worship stemmed from a common source. It appears that various nations had the idea that fire, in one way or another, was necessary to cleanse from sin. The Israelites were repeatedly forbidden to let their seed, quote, pass through the fire to Molech, unquote, as we can read in numerous places in the Bible. Leviticus 18.21, Jeremiah 32.35, 2 Kings, Kings 23, verse 10. And I'm going to read all these quotes to you right now, of course, like always, from the King James Version. Don't pass through fire. By the way, this comes back in the next chapter, so remind yourself of what I read right here now, when you listen to me in chapter 10. Quote, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination, to cause Judah to sin. And he defiled Topeth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might take his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. Unquote. And those were readings from Leviticus 18.21, Jeremiah 32.35 and 2 Kings 23, verse 10. Molech, who some identify with Bel or Nimrod, some, I would say, the ones who do their studies, was worshipped, quote, with human sacrifices, purifications, with mutilations, vows of celibacy and virginity, and devotion of the firstborn, unquote. Sometimes he was represented as a horrible idol with fire burning inside, so that, so that was so, sorry. Sometimes he was represented as a horrible idol with fire burning inside, so that what was placed in his arms was consumed. In the picture that I will see to show here in the video, a heathen priest has taken a baby from its mother to be offered to Molech. Lest the parents should relent, a loud noise was made on drums to hide the screams of the baby. Remind you. The word for drums is tofim, from which comes the word tophet. The place mentioned in verses such as Jeremiah 7 verse 31. Quote, and they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. While drums sounded, bands played and priests chanted, Human sacrifices were devoured in the flames. It is indeed sad that multitudes of people have believed that such cruel rites, or the payment of large sums of money, or human works, can pay for their sins. The good news is that the price has already been paid by our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Salvation is by grace, by favour that could never be merited by money, human works or sacrifices. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 ends this chapter of the book. Quote, For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unquote. This was chapter 9 of the book 
Babylon Mystery Religion Read, explained and commented by Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth Thank you very much for your attention, listening, watching, commenting, exchanging ideas and meanings. It was a long read and um, as I said I will provide the link from the letter from the Pope in the description box of the video so that you can read it for yourselves. what he said there you know it really makes you think how people can be so gullible to believe what that guy rants from his golden throne wearing a fish hat and funny dresses red shoes that resemble the blood of the martyrs that the Roman Catholic Church persecuted and exterminated all through the history of the last 2,000 years. That people can sit there and listen to when the Pope says these things or stand there like they do in St. Peter's place and then, uh, you know, next to the obelisk standing on the biggest sign of Anu in the world, that sun wheel, that eight-sparked cross, and the Pope speaking ex cathedra as he were God from the balcony of the Vatican, and the people just taking it in and in and believing it and living it, without ever questioning. When you read just a little bit in the New Testament, just a little bit from all the four Gospels, you don't have to read them all. Just read, I don't know, two, three, four chapters. Nothing, nothing Jesus Christ ever taught is to be found in the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, the seat of Satan, the synagogue of Satan, the seat of the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist, the one Daniel warned us about, the one Paul warned us about, the one John wrote about in the revelations of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible. Nothing. Nothing the Pope says, does, ordains, or whatever does, is biblical. Nothing. He is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. He always was, he is, and he always will be. Just turn to the Bible to this wonderful Word of God that gives us so much peace, that gives us so much truth, more truth than we can bear after this life of lies, indulgences, money for happiness, earthly happiness maybe, but heavenly happiness, I don't think so, God doesn't think so, Jesus Christ doesn't think so. Every Bible-believing Christian knows it is not so. So, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and until next time, Jogna 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. Until next time, God bless you all, and bye-bye.